All right. Hey, good morning to all of you. Wow, was the worship not just awesome this morning? Uh, I get to, uh, to be in the West at the 9 o'clock service, and in the last few songs, uh, I get to be right there in the little hallway, and uh, I was like, no, just keep going. Uh, we can cut the message. Let's just keep going with the worship. Um, and, and then uh, over in the West, it was great as well, but all of us are getting ready for this coming week. Uh, it is going to be a great week. Vacation Bible school starts Monday, uh, and if you've not registered your kids, uh, I, I don't know if it's n too late, but I would just tell you it's not too late. Just say, Pastor JJ said it wasn't too late, and go ahead and register your kids. Hey, today we're continuing, as Kim said, in our sermon series called Ambassadors. By the way, uh, Chris and I only plan for five weeks in this sermon series, uh, but due to so many emails and conversations we were having, Having. We have just continued this thing. Uh, I now think it is the longest sermon series we've ever done. Um, and so today, we're actually going to do a two-part series on being an ambassador. Because today, I believe it is the most important place where you can represent Christ. Or let me say this. It is the place where a lot of us misrepresent Christ. And that is being an ambassador in your home. Billy Graham said this, the hardest place to live out your Christian faith is trying to live out your Christian faith with family. So today we're going to take a look at what does it mean to be a, an ambassador in your home. And I would say to those of you who uh, maybe you are not married or maybe you do not have children, here's what we would say. Uh, what does it look for you to be an ambassador to the next generation? Because trust me, they're looking and watching you, especially when we gather. You know, they say this, rarely does one generation surpass their predecessors morally and or spiritually. A quote I would have you look at is, this is why someone said, the compromises of one generation become the excesses of the next. Someone else said this, one generation sows the wind, the next generation reaps the hurricane. So very often, the only thing that stands in the way of a crumbling society is that society's parents, moms and dads, and I would add to that, those that influence the next generation. Parents, though, you are our culture's last defense. And that is why today uh, and next week we want to share uh, the role of the parent being an ambassador. Now, just so you know, we're splitting this in two weeks. Here's why we're doing so. Uh, this week, you're going to get the theology behind the family. And then next week, we're going to share uh, a lot of practical suggestions that you can do. But this week, we wanted to share more of the theology behind that. And, and I just want to make sure you know up front, uh, Sharon and I do not claim to be experts in parenting. But we do know that the Bible... Bible has given us many principles that, and precepts that we have used throughout our parenting. And so today, we want to share some of those truths with you, all right? Uh, the fight for the hearts of our children. I think it's real. Uh, I think it's literal. I think it's perpetually raging because I don't believe the enemy sleeps. And so today we want to take a look at this. How can you and I be intentional? How can we be relentless and confident in our parenting and our influence on the next generation in a way that will have a godly impact on them? So if you have your Bibles this morning, I'm going to ask you to take those out, turn those on. If you don't, all the verses are going to be on the screens for you. The book of Deuteronomy, it is one of our Old Testament books. It is a part of what we would call the Torah, uh, the first five books, the books of the law or the books of Moses. So the book of Deuteronomy. And so Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 through 9. And as you're turning there, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you would please stand for the reading of God's holy word, the scripture, the Bible. Deuteronomy 6. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you go, well, yeah, of course he is. Well, remember we even mentioned this last week. There is what's known as the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. It's this thought that we call it the Trinity, where there are three gods in one, one God in three. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but they are one. Verse 5 says, you shall love the Lord your God, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And many of our Jewish friends have continued that practice uh, in the the Middle East, even today, verses 8 and 9. But let's pray, and then this morning we want to look at how you and I can be an ambassador in our home, or how you and I can be an ambassador to the next generation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege. Um, Lord, today we don't have to uh, go to Amazon and buy a book or go to the library and check a book out on philosophies of, of family. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful for your holy word, the, the, the book that many of us are holding or looking at even now. And Lord, we thank you for the timeless truths that lie within it. So God, today, help us to correctly uh, share your scripture. And Lord, would your Holy Spirit take your words and Lord, challenge us, encourage us, convict us, and move us forward in our pursuit of becoming a godly man, a godly woman, having a godly family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Yeah, I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey, your spiritual pursuit, uh, but I, I, we don't say this often. I want to just say it today. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, yesterday, I was here, and I was preaching to empty uh, chairs, and uh, they, now they don't talk back, and they obey everything I say, uh, but I miss not having you here, and so I just want to let you know, uh, we do not take for granted your attendance and your participation in worshiping of the one true God, so thank you. Uh, for some of you, maybe you are brand new to this, uh, maybe a friend uh, has encouraged you to be a part of this, maybe you're going through some life challenges, and uh, you thought, hey, coming to church would be a great place, and we would say yes, and and again, thank you. Some of you, I mean, you've been all in, in your journey of pursuing Christ for a long time, and again, uh, you understand that you're you're never going to arrive, right? Like, we're constantly uh, following, walking after the Lord, so again, thank you for being here, and I also believe that by you being here, it does make a difference. Uh, Just your presence makes a difference in the lives of your children and in the next generation. The truth is this, that our obedience to the Lord, therefore we could also say our lack of obedience to the Lord, it does have an effect on our children, uh, grandchildren, even great-grandchildren, generations to come, and, and their life is going to be affected by the way that you live out what you say you believe. Deuteronomy 6.2, that was a verse just before those that I had you stand for me to read, says this, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep his statutes and his commandments, which I commanded you. Now watch. You, your son, and your grandson all the days of our life. Meaning uh, there is this generational uh, thought that we are taught in the scriptures. That, That what you do in your following of God, it's going to have impact on those that look up to you. And especially those that are under you. 
But I just want to encourage you today. It does make a difference. And and possibly um, you have misunderstood that following the ways of the Lord, yeah, that's good, but how is that going to help my son, my daughter advance in this world in which they live in? And I would tell you greatly. Uh, Let me give you just one example. There was a pastor, preacher, philosopher. His name was Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards uh, was a part of what was known as the first great awakening. And man, do we need another one, right? Like we're praying for whatever number we're on, but the next great awakening. Awakening. And Jonathan Edwards was used by God to be a part of the first great awakening. He did so by preaching this masterful, masterful sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And wow, did it rock the people of Boston. I mean, to the point of during the middle of the day when they were at their lunch break, People would flood the churches to hear more, to pray, to worship. It had an incredible impact, not only on Boston, but all of the surrounding areas. A study was made concerning what happened to the descendants of Jonathan Edwards. Really what they wanted to know was what happens to those children and great-grandchildren of those who follow after God with all of their heart. So here's what happened. Listen to this. 14 of them became college presidents. 100 professors. 100 of them became ministers of the gospel or missionaries or theological teachers. More than 100 of his descendants became lawyers and judges. 60 of them were doctors. And many more were authors of books and or journals. And I read that and went, maybe we're doing some things wrong. (laughs) Because a lot of us would love if that was our family tree, right? And yet Jonathan Edwards, who was this pastor, preacher, philosopher up in the Boston area who just pursued God with all of his heart, but that had massive influence on the next generations. You know, godly men and women are the bedrock of any spiritual community, church, and I would say having godly children is obviously a blessing, but many, many parents long for that, but they just don't seem to know, like, how do you actually produce that? Like, I think that is the great question. How do we have godly kids? You know, issues of marriage and parenting and families. Uh, Those are not necessarily easy to give advice on. uh, Because I would tell you this, hard and fast rules are difficult to come by. Strategies that may work in certain families and certain children, uh, they don't necessarily work exactly the same in other families and with other children. Uh, Many of you know, but we have three sons. We feel like, uh, now they would disagree with the youngest, but we feel like we have parented them all the same. And at different parts of their life, uh, they were in different spiritual areas of their life. Now, with the last one, they say we grandparent him. Um, (laughs) I'm not sure if they're right or wrong uh, and not necessarily worried about their opinion on that. Uh, But here is the thought. Uh, Sometimes we get advice maybe from younger parents and you would go, yeah, but you just don't have the hindsight. Uh, Like, you know, it's awesome that you parent a two-year-old. But if you ever parent a 13-year-old, right, it's like when you parent the two-year-old, Come back around in 10 or 11 years and let's have another talk. And for those of you who parent like a six-year-old, those that are parenting a 16-year-old are going, okay, uh, let's wait until keys are brought into the situation, right? Let's wait until this thing called dating is brought into the situation, and then we'll talk parenting. But however, here's what happens. 
Advice from older parents has to be tempered with the understanding that their parenting was done in a different culture. I mean, we even heard that in baptism today, right? Because of technology, uh, we were able to have gospel influence on someone in another generation where for many of us, when we first started parenting, that was not the case at all, right? But despite the challenges, there are some timeless principles and precepts that the Bible does teach us, right? There are these biblical truths, and I would say this, we should not deviate from those. Um, Now, how you execute those with your children, family, that's going to look different, but there's some biblical truths that need to stay inside your family. Number one is this, godly families begin with godly marriages. Like, if you want a godly family, you got to have a godly marriage, Um, That is why uh, I would encourage all of you who can, uh, all of our staff, all of those who are married, they've all attended what's called Weekend to Remember in partnership with uh, Family Life. Here's what every staff member who's gone on one of those weekend retreats, here's what every one of them have said, independent of one another. Two things have come back. Number one, we didn't realize how excellent it was going to be. I would say uh, a sub point to that, we didn't know how many people were going to be there. Wow, 2,000 people at each of the sites. Number two, here's what everyone on our staff said. We didn't know how bad we needed it. And I would recommend to you a weekend to remember. September 27th through 29th, we are actually having a weekend to remember in Tampa. So you don't even have to travel. It's going to be at the Hyatt downtown. Uh, you can go on our website, uh, Family Life website, learn more about that. So number one, godly families begin with godly marriages. Number two, raising godly children is a parent's mandate. Like, that's, that's the responsibility of mom and dad. And then number three, worshiping together as a family. Now, what do I mean? Like, do I mean sitting together inside a church service? Well, maybe, but maybe not. It's more to that. It's you discipling your family, praying for your family, reading God's word together, worshiping, singing, serving together, going on mission trips together. Like those are certain principles that we need to stand on. Now, how do we do that? Three ways this morning we're going to share with you. Number one has to be done with a sincere love. Number one sincere love look again at deuteronomy 6 verse 5 you shall love the lord your god with all of your heart with all of your soul now parents you you need to understand that uh, when we went to camp last week um, they gifted me the privilege to take about five or ten minutes to share with our students here's what i shared with our students Uh, give your parents some slack. Like, they're not perfect. You you know what I even told our students? A lot of your moms and dads, they feel like they're killing it in life. Like, they're winning when it comes to work. That they're winning when it comes to their marriage. Some of them, right or wrong, think they're winning when it comes to parenting. But you know where most of your moms and dads feel like they're losing? In their own personal walk with God. There's something about the enemy that does not want them to know and to live in who they are. And therefore, there's this constant guilt and shame that's over your parents. And it would be okay for you to cut them some slack. Like, it would be okay, I said this to your kids, by the way, it would be okay, I think it's the only message they heard like this, it would be okay if they come to you and say, hey, mom, dad, um, is there anything I could pray for you about? Like, you don't think that would change the spiritual temperature of South Tampa? If students started asking parents, like, hey, how can I pray for you? Hey, can you just share with me maybe what God's teaching you? Like, wow, what would happen, right? Right? And so I want you to know that because I want you to know this, parents. Your kids know that you're not perfect. Like they know that. In case you didn't know that, they know you're not perfect. So what they want to know is this, that you're sincere. 
What they want to know is that this really matters to you, that it's not just a Sunday check the box, that you're really trying, you're pursuing, that you're not playing games. Because here's what's helpful for children. For them to see a parent, and I would also say for those of you who are not an adult, uh, that they are trying they're working. They're pursuing what does it mean to live a godly life. Uh, unfortunately, here's what happens. And we, I know we had Father's Day last week. But here's what happens. A lot of times, especially the dads. Um, and, and I don't know why. Uh, but it appears that moms and women are uh, all things being equal. Okay, please know that. It seems like they're more spiritually attuned. Uh, again, I'm just going to share with you for the next few minutes some of my observations, right? Uh, as it appears to me, uh, ladies seem to lean in to their relationship with God far more than men do. A lot of men, especially once they get married, seem to lean out as opposed to leaning in, as opposed to saying like, man, now more than ever, I'm dependent upon the Lord, right? Uh, anytime that I do premarital counseling, and I do a lot of premarital counseling, I always share with them what's called the marriage triangle. All right. Many of you, if you sat through one of my five sessions with you, God bless you for that, uh, but you heard the marriage triangle. Here's what it looks like. You have God at the top, okay? Uh, and then you have the husband, and then you have the wife, and notice it's a triangle. There's distance between you guys. There's distance between you and God. But what I would encourage you to do is to become a godly man or a godly woman, and that's separate from the relationship, spiritually even, that you have with your spouse and or your friends. Like, it is a personal, intimate relationship that that you it's a sincere love that you have and notice what happens so let's say we have a godly woman we have a godly man and and they're going to get married here notice what happens with the triangle the triangle actually gets smaller meaning this you're closer right you're going to be closer together as a woman or as a man. As you pursue God, you're going to naturally be closer to one another, right? Because you're going to also notice like, wow, they're pursuing the same things I'm pursuing. And it's now a shared relationship. So it's a personal relationship that becomes a shared relationship. So you go, wow, I don't see what's wrong with that. It's once someone gets married. Here's our observation. Here's what we see. When someone gets married, the godly woman now says, I want to be a godly wife. So she, she's like continues to grow. Okay, Ask our women's director, Karen, what happens. All of a sudden, someone gets married, and they're, and they're calling, emailing, going, how many Bible studies can I take at one time? <laughs> uh, like, I want to become a godly wife. Now, gentlemen in the room, here's the sad thought. We never see that out of the man. Like we don't have men calling going, hey, uh, now I need to be a godly husband. What do I do about that? Never. And then what happens if the Lord allows, and I would say they're so blessed through uh, uh, however the means may be, if then she becomes a mom, she wants to not just be a godly woman, she doesn't want to be just a godly wife. She wants to be a godly mom. And again, dads, we don't see that. Like men in the room, we don't see the same pursuit. And, and you go, well, I don't really know like, what's the issue there. Well, one, she's growing in her relationship with God. You're not. And in all reality, it's causing distance in your relationship. Like you're not as close as you were, right? Like now we have more distance in that relationship. But here's the unfortunate thing. Here's what we know. The Bible teaches us in Hebrews that you have to be very careful that you don't drift away. Meaning this, it's really difficult just to stay at that line. So if you're, if you're not pursuing God, you're not staying here. You're going to drift. 
So, so that's even a little misrepresented because the man's never going to stay here. He's going to start going backwards. And again, it just creates a bigger gap in the relationship. <clears throat> I tell couples this. It's one of the four or five things I always say that's going to bring you back to the couch. Spiritual things. And normally it's because the godly woman is super sad when she gets here. Because she no longer recognized the godly man that she married. And there's a gap in the relationship. What would it look like <coughs> if both of them did the same thing, though? Right? Like, what would happen if he goes, hey, I don't want to be just a godly man. I want to be a godly husband. I want to be a godly dad. Notice the closeness that they're going to experience not only in their relationship with God, but in their relationship with one another. And that's why I get to that point in premarital counseling, and I always just look at her. Like, I even pretend like he's not even in the room. And I said, so you need to be very satisfied that the godly level that he's at right now is the godly level you're okay with him being at for the rest of his life? And you can tell she's like, I'm not satisfied with that. And then I'll look at him and go, that's a lot of responsibility on you. By the way, the only verse you know is women should submit to their husbands. <laughs> yeah. What about you loving her like Christ loved the church? See, because if you're not loving her, it's hard for you to lead anyone because you can't, you're not even leading yourself. By the way, we've said this before, that word submit is a Greek word, hupotasso, which means there's a willingness on the godly man's part to put himself under the godly woman's part. There's a willingness on the godly husband to put himself under the godly wife. That means there's a willingness from a godly dad to put himself under a godly mom to lift her up. To champion her. And I say this often. I have a lot of couples who come back to my couch. And, and here's the thought. I can't take it anymore. As the biblical counselor, I have to ask, what is it can you not take? Uh, what, like, what is it that you can't take anymore? And, and it's always this. I can't take the tearing down anymore. Like, I, I'm done. I reach my point. And it's just like the chopping of a tree. There's only so many times you can hit that tree before eventually it falls over. And I always follow up with this. Who gave you permission to tear each other down? Like the scripture says, you're supposed to lift each other up. Not just in championing one another, but in praying for one another and in leading one another spiritually. So number one, there has to be a sincere love. Number two, uh, there, there has to be a strong love. So it says that you are to love God with all of your strength. Now, for several years, uh, I had the privilege at Plant High School uh, to be the strength and conditioning coach. Uh, matter of fact, a couple of years, we even won a state championship when I was the strength and conditioning coach. And here's what I've seen. Uh, I've seen a lot of young men, uh, bo even boys, young men and men, uh, work out and move a lot of weight. Uh, I've seen them look exhausted when they walk out of the weight room or the training facilities. Can I just be honest? I've never seen that same effort when it comes to pursuing the things of God. And the scripture says, you got to do so with all of your strength, which means all of your might. You got to do so physically, emotionally, intellectually, spiritually. Here's the bottom line you cannot pass on to others which you yourself do not possess. Like it's going to be hard for you to leave. It's going to be hard for you to lead your spouse. It's going to be hard for you to lead your children. It's going to be hard for you to lead the next generation if you're trying to pass on something that you yourself do not possess. Um, when Sharon and I were parenting our younger uh, sons, the, the two uh, older ones who were then younger, there were many people that we sought out to get advice from. And I would tell you, that's, I think that's very biblical. Uh, but here's one thing Sharon and I cared about more than anything else. 
we just wanted our boys, because uh, especially with my background, my, my testimony, uh, we just wanted them to be passionate lovers of God. And, and I know this is going to go against some South Tampa teaching, uh, but we told them, we don't care what you do vocationally. Matter of fact, I told them, I don't care what you do athletically. Like, if you never walk on a court, a field, I don't care. Uh, matter of fact, we don't, and you got to be careful here, we, yeah, this one a little great, we don't even care what you do academically. Like, at the end of the day, we want you to love God with all of your heart. You know why? At the end of the day, nothing else matters. And again, I would just say, I, I think we should love God with our minds, so please don't hear that. Right? But at the end of the day, uh, I meet with a lot of parents who are struggling with their sons and daughters. They can give me their ACT score. They can give me their GPA, even their weighted GPA which is very impressive, but they can't share with me the last time they prayed with their kids, the last time they read scripture with their kids, the last time they served with their kids, and you just need to choose, like, which is more important, and for us, we just said, man, we just want you guys to love God, and we don't know what that's going to look like, we just want you to love God, here's why, Mark 8, 36, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? You know, sometimes, here, here's what I see. Someone who's been in ministry for over 30 years. Um, I see a lot of parents living vicariously through their children. Especially if you go to a little league. Wow. Um, I mean... Pops couldn't hit the ball off the tee, and yet now all of a sudden he has these memories of he could have been in the pros if it hadn't have been for that one coach. Uh, a lot of times what you see are parents pushing their kids towards things that only the parent is interested in. So more than anything, we just need to make sure that we're leading our kids towards a love for God. Right? Like if you're going to be an ambassador to your family, how do we represent God in a misrepresented world? Are you showing them your love for God? Uh, number three, there's a spiritual intentionality to it. Like it's not just going to happen. And there's going to be days you don't get it right. One of my favorite chaplains of all time, uh, his name is Chris Lane. And uh, we had Chris when I was serving at Indian Rocks Church. I was over the school spiritual formation. And we had Chris come in and do spiritual emphasis for us. I was convinced uh, Chris was the best chaplain we had in all of Major League Baseball. But not only was he a great chaplain, he was an amazing father. And I'll remember uh, one chapel service he talked about. My boys, we get together every morning before breakfast. And we're praying together. And we're reading the Bible together. And I'm just thinking, man, I'm the the world's worst dad. Uh, now, I had the privilege of then going to lunch with Chris, and I was like, Chris, man, I felt really convicted about that, and what does that look like? Ah, you know, I don't do it every day, and sometimes it's like, Lord, keep us safe as we fly to school, and here's a verse on the way. So please understand that you're not going to be perfect. Remember, we led with that. You're not going to be perfect, and your kids know you're not perfect, but you have to be intentional. Verses 6 and 7, and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children. Other translations say this, you are to impress them on your heart. So here's what we're saying as a parent. Um, it, it, you have a responsibility to impress or to imprint on your children the things of God, the, the commands of God. And if you want your kids to be blessed, I would even say if you want them to be favored, they have to understand those commands. You, they have to learn to process the things of this world through a, a paradigm of a Christian worldview and of the Word of God. Now, here's what would be easy for you. Well, yeah, JJ, that's easy for Chris and you to say that. I mean, after all, like, you're a pastor. I, I mean, I would hope that that's happening. But I want you to notice something from Deuteronomy 6. It doesn't say, hey, listen, 
Everybody else, do whatever you want to do, except for the Levites and the priests. Levites and the priests, pay attention. This is just for you. That's not what it says at all. Doesn't call out the Levites and the priests. It is a message for the general assembly, meaning this, all 12 tribes, you're to be a part of this, right? And, and, and so there is a way this can be done. And as we close, I'm going to give you three ways that you can do this. Number one, it has to be done with conviction, okay? Like, like it, it, it's got to be important to you. Otherwise, by the way, your, your kids can see through that. Now, I know you know that, but some of you need to go back to when you were a kid. I know your kids don't think you were ever a kid, right? But there was a time you were kids, and you could see through what was true or what was false with your parents. Your kids are doing the same thing with you, all right? So it's got to be sincere. We do in our life what we think is important. And so we live and we parent out of convictions. It's our convictions that's going to set the table that's going to determine our parenting. Deuteronomy 6.6 6. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. I want to say this. If it's not on your heart, it will have very little impact on their heart. Now, many of you are the exception to that. Instead of being the prodigal son or daughter, some of you were the son or daughter who broke away from all the other prodigals. Like You were the one in your family that kind of broke the cycle. So, several of you have decided, hey, I'm going to leave a different legacy. But all things being equal, if it's not on your heart, it's not going to be on their heart. That's why we've been teaching all summer uh, that you would soap one verse a day. That's it. I would encourage you to do like the Bible app, whatever the verse of the day is. Because not only do you get the verse, uh, you get a video that kind of explains the verse to you. Uh, you get a devotion that goes with that. You even get a prayer you can pray with that. But we would encourage you to soap that verse. What's the scripture? What's the observation? What's the application? What is a prayer? And then we've encouraged you to read one of the 66 books of the Bible this summer. Like read it uh, one time, maybe read it over and over again. Uh, join me. I'm I'm reading Proverbs. Uh, you can read it three times this summer, each chapter or chapter a, a, a day, and, and you can get through Proverbs. And then uh, we've asked you to maybe read an old classic Christian book um, and then a newer book. Okay, Again, if it's not on your heart, it's not going to be on their hearts. And those are just some ways you can get it on your heart. You can't teach what you don't know, but you're not going to teach what you don't feel passionate about. Right? Like, if I was hired today to become a soccer coach, it's not going to be good for those kids, right? Uh, zero passion for that at all, okay? Uh, there's just no passion. And so if you're not passionate about it, th then it's not going to be important. Like, you're not going to give it. And, and if the things of God are not passionate, and you go, well, if they're not, what do I do? Then start with just a verse a day. Like, just start there. And watch what happens. Watch what the Spirit of God awakens inside of you. So it has to be done with conviction. Number two, it has to be done consistently. Um, I got to pause here and say this. Praise God for an incredible early childhood ministry here at STF that right now they're not babysitting your kids. Like they're discipling your kids as early as possible. They're teaching them the commands of God. And, and many of those are volunteers. They'll sit in this service in the next hour. Some of you are sitting in here, and you're going to go to that uh, service the next hour. Praise God for that. And, and we love our early childhood ministry. And then praise God for our STF kids ministry, Elisa and her team. And, and this week, uh, this place is going to be packed out. And let me tell you a couple reasons why. One, the kids love coming here. Right, uh, the decorations, all the stuff, the the songs they're gonna sing, the the moves they're gonna learn, right? Uh, the 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 uh, refreshments they're gonna have, the wreck, but the the Bible stories, they love that. But you know the other thing is, the amazing uh, students, young adults, and and adults who'll be leaving. And, and by the way, if we could just pause for a moment, uh, I I don't know of a church where the young adults are so actively engaged in the church as they are here. 
uh, like I don't know if we could have had camp uh, if it hadn't been for our young adults. I, I don't know if we could have VBS if it wasn't for the amazing young adults and Danny and his team doing such a, a great job. And praise the Lord uh, for an STF youth ministry. Uh, where students learn the Word of God and how to pray and what does it mean to stand up for the Lord in today's day. As Karen mentioned during the baptism, we had an awesome uh, camp recap service and heard testimonies from some of our students and just the way God's moving and working. And, and then uh, Michael shared with us, there's a discipleship pathway that he's put in place uh, for all middle school and high school students. So if you have a middle school, high schooler, uh, one of the things you can do is use that discipleship pathway for you to disciple your own kid, right? But remember we talked about last week, well, what if you're a single mom? What can you do? Again, you can partner with Michael. And, and Michael will have a, a loving, caring adult who can walk alongside of them. But I would tell you, according to Deuteronomy, um, that should start with you. And j just uh, Unless there's just absolutely no way in the dynamic of the relationship it would work, uh, I would really encourage mom and dad for you to do so. All right? um, as a parent, I think we err. If we see the church, its ministries, and its programs as anything more but supplemental. That, that's all we are. We're not the steak or the chicken, the protein. We're not the carbs. We're not the vegetable. Um, we're just the supplement. Some would even say we're just the dessert, right? Like, like that's what we're to offer. So the job of STF is simply to equip and support you in raising godly children. It's not the job of STF to be only financially supported by you so that we can raise godly children. Like that, that's not what the scripture calls for. Like we appreciate your giving, but we're not giving, we're not paying so that Michael and Elisa and Danny and others can raise godly children. Like that's not the point. We're to partner with you. Verse 7 says this, you shall teach them diligently. Teach them to your children. That means this, teach it repeatedly. You've got to talk about it and talk about it and talk about Because I get a lot of dads who will say this. Well, I told them one time. Do you realize, even at this church, with all of you, that we have to announce something five to seven times before you hear it? Like, do you wish we, do you know how bad we wish we didn't have to do a, 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 an announcement video? But here's the thing. We'll have someone send us an email. I can't believe you didn't tell us we were doing it. And we're like, D we only told you seven times, right? Guess what? Your kids are a lot like you, right? Like, you got to keep telling them. Now, I also want to make sure you know this. It doesn't mean that you, like, you got to be weird or strange, okay? Doesn't mean like they come home from school or they come home from sports or their extracurricular activity and they're like, hi, mom, hi, dad, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord. Like, that's not what it's called for, right? <laughs> Like, this has to be not only conversational, but it has to be relational, right? It, this is what you are to do. It's your responsibility to steer the conversation. And I just want to remind all the mom and dads in the room, you're driving. Every kid in the room thinks they're driving. And they ain't driving. They didn't pay for the car. They didn't pay for the fuel. They didn't pay for the insurance. You're driving. Don't hand over the steering wheel. Don't give the keys away. Like you drive the conversation. So when they're telling you about their day or they're talking to you about this or that, steer the conversation, right? And by the way, you can do so in a way that is attractive and not in a way that's just going to crush everything that's going on for them. Right? Uh, it, it, it's saying something like this. Hey, in that scenario, that situation you just shared, like, how do you think that's going to turn out? Or, hey, what you're telling me, like, what do you think is going to be the long-term outcome of that? And so you can do that. And what it may look like is this. Uh, maybe your son or daughter, maybe they bring up something. And you go, oh, wow, you know, I've never heard of that. Hey, I, I don't know if I know much about that. Now, listen, the students aren't listening. Your kids aren't listening. Uh, hint, hint, clue, clue. You probably do know. But it's okay to go, huh, I don't know if I know a lot about that. 
What if we were to learn about that together? By the way, great humility in doing so. The Proverbs, which I'm in, talks a lot about you don't have to be the first one to give an answer. You don't always have to be the one feeding the answer. Like, you know what's amazing for your children? If they learn the answer with you. Like if it's a discovery. Now, you've already been there, right? You're just going to take them on the journey for the first time. Deuteronomy 6.20 says this. When your son asks you in time to come, say, What is the meaning of these testimonies, these statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? So here's the thing. Then it's going to be a conversation, right? Um, The Proverbs, you're going to hear a lot about that this summer because that's what I'm reading. The Proverbs over and over again say this. My child, listen to my words. Here's the thing. For them to listen to your words... First of all, you have to be speaking words. The only way you're going to speak words is in a relationship. Because the relationship allows them to receive those words. But that's an investment that you're going to have to make. Now, next week, we're going to give you some practical points to parenting. But this week, I just wanted you to see. Like, if it doesn't come out of a love relationship... By the way, it's not necessarily even a love relationship. It's your first love relationship with God. Far above a guy or a girl or even children or or a next generation. And and here's why. Here's like one of those nuggets we're going to give you next week. Write this down. Rules without relationship is going to be rebellion. Let me just tell you. If you give rules and you don't have a relationship, it's going to be rebellion. Like, they're going to turn on that. But guess what? Rules with relationship, you know what happens in the outcome? Now, there's a son or a daughter. There's someone of the next gen that's following after God. So something as simple as, hey, I was just reading my Bible the other day, and I was wondering if, if maybe I could share this with you. Or, hey, I heard this new song on the Joy FM. Have you heard? I mean, I I thought of you when I heard. Can I play it for you? I mean, we just had a baseball coach in the College World Series at his press conference. Go, before I say anything, I'm going to play you guys a song. Can you imagine? University of Kentucky's baseball coach at his press conference played a Phil Wickman song. How about that? Listen, mom and dad, you can do that for your kids. He did it in a press conference. Like, I'm not answering any questions until you listen to the song. Like, you can do that, mom and dad. Like, you do know you're still in charge. So it's about you loving God. It's about you leading your kids to follow in your footsteps. And when you do that, now listen, I can't promise you Jonathan Edwards' tree. I can just say this. Maybe the reason we don't have a lot more Jonathan Edwards trees is because we don't have a lot more Jonathan Edwards. And if you want those college professors, the lawyers, the teachers, maybe. Again, you don't have to be a pastor or philosopher. Jonathan Edwards just did what Deuteronomy 6 said. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. These three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of this is love. Loving God, loving your spouse, loving your children, loving the next gen. Father, thank you for the privilege of learning some uh, precepts from your uh, truth today about what does it mean to love you? What does it mean to love um, someone else? God, what does it mean to maybe love someone that you've gifted to our care? God, I know we wouldn't be here today if that doesn't, if it didn't matter. Like if that wasn't important to us, then we wouldn't care. But Lord, I I would think if we were to survey the room, those three things would be at the top of our list. Yet God, the enemy fights so hard against us in these three categories. 
And so, God, I pray you would help us to love you. For those of us who are married, uh, help us to love our spouse. God, for those of us who have uh, next generation, God, help us to love them well. In your name we pray. Amen.